Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And so this, this is the beginning of the concluding session of what's been a very active and, and engaging day. And so I appreciate everybody's attention. Uh, but it is truly my honor and privilege to introduce to you the president of Yale University, Peter Salovey. Thank you, John. I appreciate that. Welcome, everybody. Welcome back. Uh, I'm so delighted that you're all here for the Yale Innovation Summit, and I hope it's been a stimulating day for all of you. I look forward to joining you for the rest of the afternoon. Uh, today, I have the immense honor of introducing Dr. Gerald Chen, our keynote uh, speaker. Dr. Chen is a scientist, a humanitarian, a champion of education, a leader in business and management. After earning his uh, BS and MS degrees in engineering from UCLA, he then went on to obtain an MS in medical radiological physics and a doctorate of science in radiation biology from Harvard University. He conducted postdoctoral work uh, in pathology at the Harvard Medical School and at the Dana-Farber uh, Cancer Institute. In 1987, Dr. Chen and his brother founded Morningside which is a diversified investments group uh, engaged in private equity and venture capital investments here in North America, in Asia, and in Europe. And with his strong background in science, he has been able to lead Morningside to invest in life science startups, uh, biotech companies developing cancer treatments, early detection, uh, work, uh, work on the early detection of autism, uh, full-length human DNA clones. He serves on the board of several biotech companies in North America and Europe, such as Advanced Cell Diagnostics, Matrovax, Vaccine Technologies Incorporated, and Oxyrin. He's a member of the Global Advisory Council of the International Society for Stem Cell Research, the International Board of Governors of the New York Academy of Sciences, and the Global Advisory Council of Harvard University. His professional accomplishments are really too numerous to review here, but what makes Dr. Chen great goes far beyond his achievements in business and in management. Dr. Chen exemplifies altruism. He catalyzes more acts, additional acts of generosity through his visionary leadership. Students at all levels of the world, at all levels of education and from around the world, uh, have benefit from his tireless efforts to champion education, especially science education, in a liberal arts context. His historic contributions to the Harvard T.H. Chan School of Public Health will support current and future experts as they address global health threats and have been, that gift was transformative to the Harvard's, to Harvard's public health school. Dr. Chan is a wonderful example of what many of you are all about today, and that is how academia and the private sector can come together to push the boundaries of science and technology in the service of the public good. So thank you all for being here with us, and I introduce to you Dr. Gerald Chan. Thank you, thank you, thank you Peter, pleasure. thank you. Thank you. Um, if I could have a glass of water, I, I actually have a glass of I'm not going to jump. Uh, oh, I can. I got it. Be prepared. So says the Boy Scouts. So Bill has invited me, you know, for several times to be here with you, so I'm delighted that I can finally make it today. Now, while today's event has the agenda of promoting innovation among the Yale students and the faculty, I learned that the announcement of this talk has gone out to the Yale, fa uh, Yale Alumni Network. A friend of mine who's a Yale alumnus wrote me an email yesterday, yesterday saying that he saw my face on the front page of, um, of the Yale website. He, he thought it was a prank. <laughs> well, so 
number of my friends have said that they would come to this talk, so I will try to make the talk, you know, to, to have content that appeals to a broader audience. I fully understand to have something for everyone means that there's not much for anyone. <laughs> I'm also mindful of the luncheon that President Salovey uh, hosted for me at his residence two months ago, at which time we had a lively discussion with a group of faculty on the role of the research university in today's society. I do want to pick up on some of the points that we touch on that day and to offer my further thoughts. My primary mission today, as I understand it, is to nurture the impulse for innovation that is throbbing on college campuses everywhere. Now, I, I'm, I'm pleased to see the uh, median age of this um, audience. I didn't know what to expect. I thought it was going to be a bunch of undergraduates purporting to write some apps, <laughs> and <laughs> that would be a startup. So I understand today from Peter that the undergraduates have largely left. <laughs> So this is indeed a mature, you know, uh, audience. And we're not talking about just writing apps. Um, but by speaking on biotechnology, that is what I want to focus my talk on, I hope to paint a picture of the complexities of the innovation process and the imperative of the university to be an integral part to an innovation economy. Now, I work almost exclusively in biotechnology, even though I have invested in internet and tech companies in times past. The difference between characteristics of companies in these two industries cannot be more stark. Products of internet companies let us live better. We find it mind-boggling that we live so long without Uber or Facebook or Twitter, but in reality, life really wasn't so bad back then. <laughs> but in contrast, we look back on how certain diseases were a sure sentence of death in the past and now a curable, manageable, or maybe even preventable. If tech matters in how we live, biotech matters in whether we live. Knowing that what we are doing here can mean life instead of death for some people is incredibly gratifying. Now, countervailing this emotional gratification is the hardship that stems from biotech companies being both capital intensive and having long product development cycles. Biotech products are highly regulated by the FDA, which constrains the development steps to be executed in series rather than in parallel. For the investors, this means liquidity events can be a long time in coming and the lid on the magnitude of payoff relative to the, the amount of capital consumed is hard to shatter. With respect to market penetration, products of internet companies can spread virally and at the end, the winner takes all. Speed to market is of the essence. Products that are platforms for exchanges, be they exchanges of commerce or of social interaction, are particularly difficult to unseed once they achieve market leadership. For biotech products, the winner-take-all characteristic is not impossible, but it rests on totally different premises. The exclusion of competition may come from patent protection, or market exclusivity granted by regulatory agency, or simply the time and cost of developing competing products. Patents and regulatory exclusivity have expiration dates. Speed of development is therefore of no less importance, even though the long development cycle in biotechnology often dulls one's sense of urgency. The riskiness of investing in biotech also comes from the outcome being binary. If a company runs out of money before the product gets regulatory approval, or if the product fails to secure regulatory approval at the end of its clinical trial, there is little salvage value to the enterprise. 
This is not to say that once a product secures regulatory approval, it's smooth sailing thereafter. The financial performance of the product is subject to price negotiations with third party payers under a public sentiment that is ever more unfavorable to the rich pricing of drugs. Notwithstanding such difficulties, the biotech industry is still in good shape. Compared to earlier generations of biotech companies, the industry has matured enough to have its own norms, good practices, and a pool of experienced operators such that it can attract institutional capital to invest in it. But most fundamentally, the rise of the biotech industry follows from the rise of modern life science, much like the boom of the semiconductor industry in the, last, in the second half of the 20th century follow from the groundbreaking discoveries in physics in the first half of that century. In turn, the, the explosive growth of life science that we are seeing today is not a result of anyone's choice, not e nor even a result of government funding priorities per se. It is the consequence that follows from the evolution of knowledge within the human civilization. Clark Kerr, one of the giants in higher education in the 20th century, had this to say in 1962 about life science. I want to read this paragraph to you both because of its eloquence and its prescience. And I quote here. The fastest growing intellectual field today is biology. Here there is a veritable revolution where the doctrine of evolution once reigned supreme. To the classifying efforts of the past are being added the new analytical methods of the present, often drawn from chemistry and physics. There are levels of complexity to be explored in all living structures. The code of life can now be read, soon it will be understood, and soon after that, used. It is an intellectual discovery of unique and staggering proportions. The secrets of the atom, atom, much as they have changed and are changing human activities on this planet, may hold no greater significance than the secrets still hidden in the genetic code. If the first half of the 20th century may be said to have belonged to the physical sciences, the second half may well belong to the biological. Resources within the universities will be poured into the new biology and into the resulting new medicine and agriculture, well supported though medicine and agriculture already are. That's Clark Kerr's words. Now the most monumental example of the analytical methods that Clark Kerr talked about has got to be X-ray diffraction, which elucidated the double helix structure of DNA. Ever since then, both the endless intrigues of how life functions and the potential impact of applying such knowledge to improving human health have proven to be irresistible in attracting intellectual energy from all fields of science into biology and medicine. In a conversation I had with the president of MIT last year, he told me that two thirds of all the research across the faculty of the institute has something to do with life science. Today's flourishing biotechnology industry is a prime example of how university research has become an economic engine in the knowledge economy. It used to be that university research ended in papers being published in prestige, prestigious journals. That all changed in 1980. By the passage of the Bido Act, Congress gave the intellectual property rights of any invention arising from federally supported research to the cognate university. The intent, the intent of Congress was indeed that the scientific discoveries made in universities would find a better way of being pushed out to industry where commercial development can follow from the academic research. Either intended or unintended, Baidu has created, an has created an economic incentive that changed the behavior of universities. 
Putting it crudely, universities are now in both the business of creating knowledge and monetizing knowledge. I do not say this with any pejorative overtone, rather I celebrate the translation of research output into commercialization as a public good. Life science is now exerting a powerful pull for universities to engage with the biotech industry. Such rapprochement raises all kinds of issues for the university, which historically has always been guarded in getting mixed up with business. This is not only because no university wants to run afoul of the IRS, it is part and parcel to the university's struggle for its own identity. One conception has it that the university should be aloof and disinter disinterested from commercial interests, lest they compromise the university's moral authority to be the conscience of society. But Abraham Flexner, on the other hand, suggested that the modern university, like all human institutions, and I quote, is not outside but inside the general social fabric of a given era. It is not something apart, something historic, something that yields as little as possible to forces and influences that are, that are more or less new. Science, democracy, and other forces steadily increasing, increasing in intensity are creating a different world of which universities must take account. It is to this perennial and unresolved struggle for self-identity that life science has come along to offer a deal to the university. If I hark back to my early comment that if tech matters in how we live, biotech matters in whether we live. Because biotech can save lives, it is therefore thought to be less burdensome for the universities to engage with this industry. Such engagements do not violate the university's self-conscious mandate to be a force of good in society. I cannot imagine that it would be nearly as acceptable to the constituents of the university or the outside public if the engagement was with the milita military industrial complex. Of course, it would be dis disingenuous to say that the prospect for financial gain through royalties is not an inducement for the university to welcome this engagement. The relationship between the university and the biotech industry has now progressed from rapprochement to symbiosis. I don't suppose that the American public will find this engagement to be offensive. In supporting their universities, the American people, with their pragmatic, utilitarian, and anti-intellectual character, have always demanded that the public good they derive from the university be tangible and material benefits. That the university should serve society is a characteristic of American universities seen as early as the founding of Harvard University in the colonial days. The historian Henry Steele Cominger considered this as a major departure of American universities from the European forebears, and that the Americans were the first people to use their schools and, un and universities for non-academic social purposes. The founding of the land-grant universities, a monumental development in higher education that is quintessentially American, had as its premise that the university should serve society by improving agriculture and the mechanical arts. The idea of the university as an ivory tower, a cloister precinct for scholars to luxuriate in a high culture that is detached from society has never occupied the commanding heights in American higher education as Oxford and Cambridge had for centuries in England. History has shown that the American universities have not disappointed the American public. The current boom in life science research in American universities may well deliver a dividend more lucrative than what the American public has ever received from supporting their universities. To be sure, 
The engagement of the university with the biotech industry is fraud with pitfalls and will place new burdens on the university. Safeguarding academic freedom must be fortified if the perceived near-term commercializability of a research project is not to take precedence over the university's commitment to a disinterested pursuit of the truth. History has shown that some of the most impactful discoveries were never thought to be useful from the outset. Deans and department chairs must not become inadvertent venture capitalists. Mm -hmm. Similarly, the open exchange of information among scientists must not be imp impeded. Churlish players from industry will make inappropriate demands. It is up to the university to stand its ground and defend the academic tradition. If the university becomes a handmaiden to industry, it will be a loose-loose situation for both. The value of the university to industry depends vitally on its independence. As more and more faculty members become interested in spinning out their research into commercial development, the university is now expected to provide support such as guidance and patent strategy, fees for fi filing patents, sourcing financial investors, and making connections to potential industry partners. The quality of such support services, together with the financial arrangement between the university and the faculty member, have become a factor in faculty recruitment and retention. In a time when universities are locked in an arms race for talented professors, this factor cannot be ignored. Now let me return to the relationship between the university's life science and the biotech industry. It is a curious fact that whereas there are universities with excellent life science research in many parts of this country, the biotech industry is heavily concentrated in two areas. Boston and the Bay Area. Using real estate space for biotech R&D as a surrogate metric, Boston and Bay Area together account for more than half of the country's stock. Whether a university can become an engine for, the, for a vibrant biotech industry in its region depends on many factors, some of which the university can control and some of which are beyond the control of the school. With due respect to idiosyncratic nuances and constraints, I'd like to suggest five areas that the university, together with other stakeholders of a biotech ecosystem around the university, can work on. First, I want to talk about university research in life science. Research is the basis for translation. For this, both the quantity and quality of a research, of, of a university's research matter. There is no getting around the fact that scientific research is a journey into the un unknown. Luck or unplanned outcomes is always a factor. As long as luck or probability is involved, a, large, a larger base improves the odds. A large research base also makes for richer intellectual environment with more opportunities for cross-fertilization of ideas. When it comes to quality, the commercializable science is not necessarily the latest breakthroughs that end up on the cover of science or nature. Novel science may have too much white space that needs to be filled in before it is ready for translation. Deep science, which come from patient and tedious work, can also be very fruitful. Now, a number of publications have come out in recent years to show that more than half of the discoveries published in reputable journals, academic journals, by academic researchers are not repeatable when pharmaceutical companies try to replicate the data. I don't think it is the case that so many of the academic scientists are crooks who fabricate data, at least not in this country. And I think <laughs> <laughs> no implication. <laughs> uh, <laughs> so um, 
at least not in this country. I, I, I don't think that's the case. The whole uh, regimen, you know, of self-censorship -censor in science, I think, is still alive and well and still functional. The difference is that scientists in industry conduct their experiments with the view of developing a drug that can gain FDA approval. The incentive for academic scientists, on the other hand, is to generate data that are publishable. Experimental conditions are therefore often manipulated until an efficacy signal is shown. As an academic exercise, journal reviewers have no reason to be wary about those experimental conditions. Drug developers, on the other hand, would be concerned whether these experimental conditions would be acceptable to the FDA or whether they bear sufficient semblance to the human pathology for which the, the, the drug would have to address. The use of tumor xenograph in immunodeficient mice is a prime example of this. It has been said that cancer has been cured in mice many times over. Compared to their counterparts in industry, the academic scientists are often severely resource constrained. When it comes to animal models, chemical purity, or good practice in process, it is unrealistic to expect that academic scientists can measure up to FDA standards. Still, it would be productive if academic scientists can have more of a grasp of how a drug developer thinks. For this, the boundary between acad academic science and industry should become more porous in terms of information and personnel exchange. There's no reason why personnel movement should be a one-way flow from academia to industry and not the other way around. One mechanism for bringing people from industry back to academia is to create position of what we call at Harvard professor of the practice. These need not be lifelong tenure positions. In fact, by making these appointments to be of a finite term, it becomes easier to attract people from industry for a stint in academia. Such exchanges will be mutually beneficial for both academia and for industry. For any university with a sizable volume of biomedical research, it makes sense for there to be courses that expose the scientists to the drug development process. These can be in the form of professional development courses taught by industry veterans rather than formal academic courses. Case studies are particularly useful. For trainees such as graduate students and postdoc fellows, the prospect of securing an academic position is not as bright today as in times past, whereas the number of jobs in the biotech industry is still growing. Having this kind of ex educational exposure would make them more desirable candidates in a competitive job market. Two technological developments in recent years have encouraged a convergence between IT and biotech. That is the explosive growth in computational power and in genomic sequencing power. This convergence has received considerable impetus from IT technologists and investors who, with the thinning of investment opportunities in the IT space, have migrated to investing in biotech. I see this in China, as I do in America. They invariably bring with them the mindset and the tools that have served them well in the IT space. Most prominent is the notion that big data will solve all biological problems. I do want to sound a note of caution against this simplistic thinking. I refer to the age-old conundrum of epidemiology which is that population statistics can, so, can show association, but not causality. The associations can be causal, or they can be spurious. Once in a while, the association can be so tight that one feels safe to make the leap of ascribing causality in the absence of mechanistic elucidation. The epidemiology of cigarette smoking and lung cancer done by Sir Richard Dahl in the early 1950s 
is a, is a classic example. My personal scientific sensibilities confine me to the skepticism that any association unearthed from population data can at best be a hypothesis. Big data is therefore useful in hypothesis generation. It is a powerful alternative or adjunct to bottom-up scientific inquiry. Powerful as this new epistemology may be, the hypotheses must still be subject to the same experimental verification and ultimately human clinical trials. Therein come the long time and the high cost. Andy Grove of Intel had once raised the prospect of a Moore's law for life science. While such geometric growth may be possible for the acquisition of genomic information, it is not possible for biotech products being developed. Second, the interface between university and industry needs to work more productively. By this, I mean primarily the tech transfer function. Other than adequate staffing in order to be responsive, I do not think it productive for universities to run tech transfer like a for-profit operation. Too much unproductive energy is spent on haggling over minutia of licensing terms. A number of universities have gone to standardized licensing terms, such as the North Carolina plan. Ultimately, the university has to see the, the licensee from industry as a partner and not as a villain who comes to rip off the university's crown jewel. Both sides will have to bear some risk as it is not possible that all the risks be anticipated. Third, most university research output that is ready for publication is not ready for attracting venture capital. There is the need for further development, variously known as pr uh, providing proof of concept or de-risking. It is incumbent upon the university to enable this work. This includes providing wet lab space as well as funding either from the university's internal resources or resources raised from external sources, be they philanthropic or for-profit in nature. One way some universities have addressed this funding need is by tapping into their donor base and offering this as an opportunity for venture capital investment or venture philanthropy. Let me say a few words about venture capital. For me, the term venture capital carries two meanings. Capital seeks return, financial return. Venture, on the other hand, connotes taking risk and doing something that has not been done before. Venture implies a recognition of certain deficiencies in the present and an attempt to re remedy that deficiency by innovation. In other wor words, venture capital is about taking financial risk in an, attempt, in an attempt to create a better future. In the investment world, there is a tendency to treat venture capital simply as another asset class, no different from stocks and bonds and real estate and hedge funds and private equity. Take the historical return profile of each of these asset classes and calculate the efficient frontier and you get a optimal portfolio. For capital that only seeks a financial return, this is a valid view that is unassailable. By highlighting the non-financial aspect of venture capital, my hope is that capital that is not tethered to seeking only a financial return would invest in the biotech industry or biotech ventures. This includes personal wealth for which the owner has absolute sway over its disposition and philanthropy. By definition, the financial return expectation of philanthropy is zero. It counts returns in terms of life saves or knowledge advanced rather than dollars of profits made. Such capital is sorely needed at the interface between late stage academic research and early stage biotech. The financial risk 
of investing in this interface is high. Some years ago, the folks at UCSF formed a fund to support faculty research that needs bridging to venture funding readiness. I participated, but told them to consider my participation as philanthropy. In other words, my return expectation for that investment is zero. If one can do well by doing good, that would be the best of both worlds. Hence, there is now the hybrid model of venture philanthropy. Now, the poster child of successful venture philanthropy in biotech has got to be the Cystic Fibrosis Foundation, which, working together with the pharmaceutical company Vertex, developed the drug Kaleidico. For the first time, there is a cure for CF patients whose disease is caused by a certain mutation in the CFTR gene. The foundation held a royalty for the drug, which it then monetized in a $3 billion deal. With that cash, the foundation can fund genetic characterization of every CF patient in this country, as well as the development of drugs that address CF patients with other mutations. There is now a real possibility that over 90% of all CF patients will have a cure in the foreseeable future. Fourth, for a geographic region to develop its biotech industry, there must be an adequate pool of venture capital. I can point to a number of regions around the world where there is great science being done but suffer from the lack of financial capital to back the startups. The San Diego area with UCSD, Scripps, Salk, and San Fabernum is a massive research base with world-class science, but there is virtually no locally-based venture capital. The same is true of much of British science. One attempt now to jumpstart a solution to this problem is for local private wealth to take the lead. Wealthy families, such as the McDonald family, or the Danforth family of St. Louis are creating funds to support the translation of research output from the local universities. In many cities in the UK, there are networks of angel investors which serve to aggregate small amounts of venture capital. But still, if a region is to develop a biotech industry, institutional venture capital is indispensable. Where there is no institutional venture capital to support the creation of a biotech industry, I have seen governments stepping in. Most Western European countries and some countries of the British Commonwealth have government schemes for supporting biotech startups. Besides making outright grants or equity investments, one common model of support is to refund what the biotech company has spent on hiring people in that country. For example, some American biotech companies have set up a Canadian sub, uh, subsidiary just in order to access subsidy from the Canadian government through the shred scheme. The Canadian government will refund up to 35 cents on every dollar that the company spends hiring people in Canada or outsourcing work to Canadian CROs. But the most aggressive government subsidy schemes nowadays has got to be found in China. These schemes are offered, are offered by local governments rather than the central government. The play is to use tax receipts gathered from local, low-value-added industry to subsidize and are upgrading to a high-value-added industrial base. Take a place like Suzhou. By aggressively courting biotech companies to set up there through financial subsidies and investments, the Suzhou BioBay today is a robust hub of biotech companies, whereas there was hardly any biotech there 10 years ago. Here in the States, both the state of California and the state of Texas have had aggressive subsidy schemes. It is quite problematic when the state government acts more to drive out businesses than to attract them. It is a problem and I'm afraid that this university has to contend with. Fifth, 
And perhaps the most important factor for a biotech hub is talent. For a, ta but for a biotech company to develop, there must be expertise covering many functional areas. The, emer the emergence of highly competent contract research organizations or CROs, many of them located in China or India, has eliminated the need for biotech startups to have all functional expertise in-house. Nevertheless, experienced people are needed for managing the company's development programs. For this, it is important to have people that have seen the evolution of biotech companies from inception to exit or to drug approval, and therefore know how to steer the company along the journey of product development. The history of Silicon Valley shows that much of its initial growth came from people who had worked for Hewlett Packard. Having a success case not only does wonders in encouraging an entrepreneurial culture, it is also a source of financial capital and of experienced personnel for the next generation of startups. Success begets success, and so goes a virtuous cycle. The end is a cluster of biotech companies together forming a local biotech industry. A recent blog published by Bruce Booth shows that biotech companies existing within such a cluster performs better than companies that are geographically isolated. I dare say that it is very much in keeping with a university like Yale to have the ambition to make New Haven a biotech hub. It is in the best interest of the university to do so. A biotech hub in New Haven will go a long way in creating a healthy local economy around the campus. Yale already has many of the necessary ingredients. If the university's leadership would have the commitment to do so, I think this is doable. Even though I live in Cambridge, Massachusetts, and enjoy the benefit of being located in one of the world's most vibrant biotech hubs, I do want to see other regions of the country succeed. It is not healthy for the country if prosperity is highly concentrated. Too much of the nation's future is at stake. Now, I'd like to turn now to the topic of education leaving the topic of biotech, um, which is, after all, the primary function of a university. We see today many students, upon graduation or even before graduation, getting involved in startups. Young people nowadays are simply more precocious, more impatient, more activist, more creative, more enterprising, and more daring. I think you would agree with that. <laughs> um, the American culture has also valorized entrepre entrepreneurs and portrayed the startup culture as exhilarating and even intoxicating. I do not believe that the university should remake itself according to the temperament of each generation of students. But I do want to ask this question. Can the experience of doing a startup be a legitimate part of the education experience of a college student today. The conventional thinking is that startups belong to the domain of business and therefore involve skills to be acquired in business schools. I submit that the educational experience that comes from doing a startup is of sufficient generality that it should be considered or reconsidered in the light of a liberal arts education. The process of doing a startup begins with ideation. Idea comes from an active, creative mind which examines its surrounding and looks for deficiency that can be remedied by something that has not been done before. The spotting of deficiencies may come from one's book learning, or it may come from reflecting on one's own experience or observation of others' behaviors. In any case, ideation is the product of an active mind. A passive mind that just absorbs information generates no original ideas. 
any idea will have to be evaluated along multiple dimensions. Besides the conventional business value propositions, there are other dimensions such as social impact, environmental impact, culture, ethics, conflicts. It is not as simple as merely checking a list of boxes. Ideas need to be developed, pruned, synthesized, and remade. Inevitably, trade-offs will have to be made. After an idea takes form, it still has to be objectively analyzed and validated. This may involve gathering of data, reading of published papers, and synthesis of data and ideas. It may involve polling or interviewing others, which are techniques often used in social, social science research. Any business proposition will have to be defensible against skeptics who will try to shoot holes in the proposition. That process forges a more robust intellect through debate and argumentation. A plan of action will have to be devised with budgets and timelines. In other words, the idea has to be reduced to practice. All this work will have to coalesce into a cogent business plan that is in print or given as an oral presentation or as an elevator pitch. Such presentations have to move others to vote with their capital. In the old days, the college students, all college students had to take a course in rhetoric, the art of presenting an argument. The presentation of business plan is in essence an exercise in rhetoric. Whether in the formulation of the business plan or in its execution, more than likely, teamwork will be required among people with diverse outlooks and skills. The ability to understand diverse views and to craft working compromises to bring out the best of each team member, the, ab the ability to empathize and to cooperate are invaluable mental habits and skills. So it seems to me that if we remove the lens that automatically equates a startup with a financial profit motive and look at the skills involved in each aspect of the startup process, it is in fact the putting into practice of what a liberal arts education is trying to develop. I propose that we look afresh at business, especially startups, through the lens of a liberal arts education. In contemporary culture, business can be thought of as a language, just as Greek and Latin, having its own vocabulary, syntax, and logic, and giving expression to ideas and thoughts. Business can also be thought of as an art form, as much as music and poetry that gives expression to creativity. Business can also be thought of as a science, as having its own methods and generating its own worldview. It is in this light that I would like to throw out the idea that a business plan can be an alternative to a thesis or a capstone project for some college seniors. The idea is not as crazy as it sounds at first blush. Needless to say, what I have in mind here is a lot more than just writing an app. <laughs> when President Drew Fowles started the President's Innovation Challenge at Harvard, it was essentially a social enterprise business plan competition. The description on the web, on the, on the web page reads, the President's Innovation Challenge prompts the Harvard student body to engage with issues facing the world and to discover ways to make the world work better. We challenge you to solve social problems, equitability, sustainability, and safety. Respond to the need for innovation within the health and science industry and other areas that transcend categories. Having observed and judged some of the projects presented in the President's Challenge, I consider the good ones to be splendid combinations of scholarship and practice. The intellectual content 
and the amount of effort that go into such a project is no less than what goes into preparing a senior thesis. We imagined the business plan can be a tool for executing the objectives of a liberal arts education. Now, I'm aware that Yale is a bastion of the classical liberal arts tradition. In suggesting a business plan in lieu of a thesis for some students, certainly not for all students, I know I'm at risk of being run out of town as, <laughs> as a heretic or worse yet, as a lunatic. <laughs> in anticipation of this fate, I did check my sanity by rereading the 1828 document reports on the course of instruction in Yale College. <laughs> this historic document, written by a committee of the Yale Corporation and faculty, is the result of a thoughtful exercise which attempted to, de to define what a liberal arts education should be. It profoundly impacted the direction of higher education in America for many decades. The views expressed in this document are very much off its time, meaning that they're outdated. <laughs> um, but the intent of the writers behind the writing of this document still bears our taking notes today. In particular, I, I notice, uh, or I take note of the admonition in that document that the college, and I quote, ought not to be stationary, but continu continually advancing, and that changes may from time to time be made with advantage to meet the varying demand of the community to accommodate the course of instruction to the rapid advance of the country in population, refinement, and opulence. While the goals of education are timeless, the tools for achieving those goals will, of necessity, change from time to time. A classical liberal arts education exposes the student to ideas that are timeless, as indeed the basis for moral choices are timeless. A liberal arts education also enables the student to fuse these timeless ideas with the timely skills that he has acquired through his education. We want our students to be of their time, perhaps even ahead of their time, if they are to be the future leaders, and yet embody the character and the mental habits that are tested by time and proven to be timeless. The challenge to every generation of educators is how best to achieve these noble goals. In this light, I applaud the addition of the Yale Innovation Summit to the Yale community. It will bring benefits to the students and to the university in untold ways. So I send you all my best wishes for continuing success, and thank you for including me in today's proceedings. Thank you. Thank you very much, sir. I hope no one's okay. <laughs> no, it was all okay. I'm not going to let anybody ask Q&A, though, if you don't oh, mind. I, I don't care. Know. Whatever. I want to take a moment just to thank Dr. Chen for his challenge. Um, I happen to know that it is very consistent with, with many of the aspirations that President Salovey has for the university, but it's always great at the end of a great day to be to raise the bar, and we appreciate the fact that you've done that for us. And so thank you, and if you'd join me one more time, and thank you. Now, I would like to introduce you to my colleague, Erica Smith. Erica is the director of um, a rather new initiative that is the beneficiary of that venture philanthropy uh, from Len Blavatnik uh, to create a new type of award, uh, a challenge prize for accelerating our innovation. Um, we have to admit, uh, because I have my colleagues here from Harvard, 
that we have been stealing the best of their ideas. So there you go, Curtis. I have now acknowledged that. So thank you very much. Um, but we have been spending the, the past year culling uh, some great projects. And I'm, this is our opportunity now to reward that activity. And I want to introduce Erica. Thank you. So great to be here with you this afternoon. As John said, I'm Erica Smith. I'm the director of the Blavatnik Fund for Innovation here at Yale. Uh, our university did receive $10 million generously donated by the Blavatnik Family Foundation late last year to translate life sciences technologies to the market in therapeutics, devices, and diagnostics. And with our amazing investment advisory board, many who are sitting in the audience here and were on panels today, we selected the absolute top ideas um, coming out of the university and designating them as the Blavatnik finalists, 17 of these projects. Um, and over the last five months, we've worked very, very closely with these individuals to define and redefine what data, what key experiment, what are the pieces that we can use this money for that will then create that key inflection point to be able to engage with industry and to provide partnerships for venture investment as well. And I have to say both personally and professionally, this has been absolutely the highlight of my career to be able to work with these committed, devoted, and really inspired people looking to take their technology and advance that to the world. But instead of listening to me talk about the process and, and the inspiration, I'd like to share with you a short video about their process and speak to the finalists themselves. So with that, we can start the video. I think I wanted to be a doctor. I wanted to be an astronaut. <laughs> an actress. A scientist. I wanted to be a kid forever. <laughs> I had uh, a passion um, for the discovery of the unknown. Everything from biology to physics, how the world worked, how the body worked. And there was a lab that required some dissection of small animals. I actually threw up. Medicine was probably not the best career for me. I was working in the theater in New York, and I still wasn't happy. But while I'd been in college, I'd also taken a lot of science classes. The science really took my interest very early on. That was through grade school, through high school. Well, that's what really drove me. What I'm most interested in now is combining science and medicine. Actually, I grew up in the countryside, um, where I know I can see a lot of animals and plants, and those. I always wonder how those things will change. I took organic chemistry as a sophomore, and it was just amazing. Uh, the most attractive part to me is the discovery, and it's a surprise. My mother wanted me to go to medical school, so there's that. <laughs> 54 active patents, 420 in the U.S., 834 across 60 countries, 43 therapeutics in the pipeline, more than 1,300 faculty in science, science, medicine, and research, over $719 million in grant and contract funding, 2016, over 2,000 invention disclosures, 456 licenses with income, over 50 startups in New Haven, 700 million in venture capital raise. Five billion dollars in equity investments. The Blavatnik Fund for Innovation at Yale provides 10 million dollars in grants. 60 researchers applied. 17 finalists chosen. Well, um, it's, it's an exciting time to be a biomedical engineer. We know so much more about biology than we did even 20 years ago. Uh, that you can think about how to develop new tools based on a real quantitative understanding of biology. And then the specific projects that we've been working on, um, I'm personally very excited about. I think they have the opportunity to have a huge impact, and uh, I, I'd, I'd like to see that impact realized. The funding through an opportunity like this really helps us establish um, a critical mass that we need to overcome to, to take ideas, which we have lots of, to take the, uh, the specific technology that we think really has a, a major chance and, and, and get it to a point where it can be brought to the real world. And otherwise, it kind of fizzles out. It's this kind of award, this kind of program is really crucial. It's not just the knowledge, there's actually a lot of logistics, as you say, to move from some kind of scientific discovery to bring that to a therapy that makes a difference. You know, anything studied in enough detail is interesting, right? But not everything has the, has the 
opportunity to change people's lives. The Blavatnik Fund has been a game changer. I'm Erica Smith, the director of the Blavatnik Fund for Innovation here at Yale. The purpose of the Blavatnik Fund is to drive discovery in academia to products in industry that can impact patients' lives. There's funding from the National Institutes of Health and other organizations that supports a lot of the discoveries. When it actually gets to a drug and it's ready to be tested in people and profits are about to be made, companies come in. But there's this gap in between making discoveries and making dollars. There's a certain element of risk that would allow us to do much more innovative things, which is hard to actually get support for through uh, the typical funding mechanisms. Well, I have a personal interest in uh, encouraging uh, scientific innovation, and Yale is obviously a perfect base for finding new ways to invest in uh, the future of research and entrepreneurship. The quality of research and intellectual rigor at Yale is outstanding, and now I think at Yale we can bring it to a you know, next level, supporting some outstanding young brains, you know, the geniuses of our uh, generation. Beyond the funding that these awardees will receive, they will also receive opportunities to work with our entrepreneurs and residents, our advisors and mentors, our corporate partners, as well as relationships that we've formed with contract research organizations. It takes both the science and the business and it advances this innovation to the market. Being in the lab and being a scientist, I know very little about commercializing anything. That's a very key issue if you want to make something be available so that patients can make use of it faster. Yale's ability to attract a, a vibrant and diverse scientific community is one of the important elements. The work that uh, has come about in, in, in my lab well, certainly would not have been, you know, um, been accomplished if it wasn't for the rich environment. There's this foundation in the sciences which is great. There's a medical practice which is thriving and, and doubling really in the last uh, decade. So both of these arms are developing and now I think from the administration on down and through the investment of a lot of resources to build these bridges to turn scientific discoveries into medical therapies. And I think Yale's doing a great job of that. We obviously have a lot more to do, but it's a very exciting time to be part of that whole process. So this, this will mean a lot to me and, and because this will um, help us to uh, basically bring what we have learned in the lab to the clinic. And not only uh, the pa patients that are in the treated in hospital, but also our friends and families. This is one of a lifetime uh, uh, opportunity for us and then uh, we are all very uh, uh, grateful to uh, this uh, contribution uh, from the, the foundation and Yale. Well, if we win, I would certainly be happy, right? There's no changing that. But mostly, I would be proud of all of the graduate students and postdoctorals and undergraduates who worked on this problem over the past decade to see all of their hard work come to fruition. Okay, well with that, I would like to invite President Salove to share a, some of his vision for innovation here at Yale, as well as to announce the 2017 inaugural class of Blavatnik awardees. Thank you. Well, thank you uh, very much, and uh, thank you once again, uh, Gerald, for a fantastic uh, talk, really pulled it all together, I think, for me and I think for many of us uh, here today. There aren't too many people in this room who have read the Yale reports of 1828, <laughs> but there's at least two. <laughs> I was very impressed. Uh, many people view that as the beginning of the uh, idea of liberal education, really traced to those, to those reports. Once again, thank you all for participating. Uh, in our Innovation Summit. We're really delighted you're here. Uh, we want to make sure that um, uh, enthusiasm and interest around entrepreneurship and innovation 
uh, continues to grow exponentially as it has uh, in the last decade or so here at Yale. And this kind of uh, day really, I think, fuels uh, that kind of future uh, uh, growth uh, here on campus. Uh, but we also want to make sure it doesn't, uh, uh, you know, that, that uh, momentum doesn't stop when people leave uh, the room. And uh, we hope that you will stay connected, uh, those of you who are not already at the university, to our university, to each other, uh, that researchers uh, uh, and uh, industry partners uh, continue to find each other and continue to talk to each other long after you go home uh, at the end of the day today. I have to tell you, I'm really awed by your uh, creativity, by the commitment to advancing science and technology to improve lives. Uh, I see discoveries represented by people here uh, that will help cancer patients live longer, that may slow the progression of Alzheimer's disease, prevent heart attacks, stop the spread of deadly viruses. I think you get the ideas. Here at Yale, uh, probably the thing that we are doing that is most important is we try to take down barriers, boundaries, bricks and mortars that get in the way of uh, people finding each other to collaborate, to work in teams, and to uh, be innovative and creative. You know, we are a, a, a university with great science and technology, but also one with great arts. And we should think about the ways in which uh, having those right next door to each other or fairly close to each other uh, stimulate each other. The arts actually help us make, help make us more creative uh, as uh, inventors and, and scientists. I know this is working because I can already see the differences. Some of them were summarized in the film that you just saw, but uh, there are so many examples of startups uh, from Yale that are here in New Haven that were supported by uh, the Office of Cooperative Research or and or Yale's Entrepreneurial Institute, and other university programs. Uh, as you heard, there's 50 startups based on Yale IP that have taken root in New Haven since 2000. They've raised over $700 million in venture capital, $5 billion in equity investments. So you, you know some of the names are Venus, which uh, is developing drugs to combat cancer, other uh, and difficult to treat diseases, Biohaven Pharmaceutical, working on drugs to treat neurological diseases, uh, and Sarah, which uh, is developing technology to monitor and assess foodborne uh, pathogens. Uh, Isoplexus, which has developed an engineering platform that helps researchers better understand how patients will respond to cancer uh, uh, treatments. Uh, many of the panelists and presenters and uh, people here today uh, represent this New Haven community uh, in, uh, in uh, pushing uh, innovation, uh, keep, keeping at least some of it local uh, here in our community and contributing to the economic development, therefore, of our community, and I'm very proud of that. Um, as always, we need to focus on proof, proof, proof of concept and other kinds of validation studies to demonstrate new technologies value. Gerald talked about that in his uh, uh, speech. We need to continue to introduce uh, uh, industry leaders, investors, mentors, scientists to each other. And that's where the Blavatnik Fund uh, comes in. Uh, this extraordinary gift from uh, the Blavatnik Family Foundation uh, is a testament, I think, to the valuable research already done at Yale and the ability to translate that research uh, into new drugs, vaccines, medical devices, uh, and other uh, advances. The fund supports uh, researchers and offers expertise and guidance to cross the gap between early stage research uh, and successful development and commercialization of products. It does this explicitly by providing uh, awards of up to $300,000 for development proposals and up to $100,000 for pilot proposals. And you can use these awards over multiple years. This year we had 60 applicants for Blavatnik Awards, and I am incredibly grateful to the group, the committee, uh, that uh, looked over these applications and, uh, and evaluated them. So we have a Blavatnik Investment Advisory Board consisting of Fred Cohn, 
uh, Stephen Knight, Liam Radcliffe, Jason Rhodes, Tim Shannon, David Singer, Stephen Squinto, Mary Tanner, Peter Terrain, Amy Arnston, all of whom uh, helped by evaluating these proposals, many of whom are here participating in today's events. I want to thank them for giving their time and their expertise to the selection process. It couldn't have been easy. We have many, many creative individuals proposing uh, ideas to us. The top 17 finalists from these 60 uh, represent innovation, innovative thinking in chemistry, in pharmacology, in neuroscience, in biomedical engineering, in obstetrics, in biophysics, and in immuno immunobiology. Uh, to all of these finalists, uh, thank you. We at Yale are winners because of your uh, great ideas. You have, you have discovered new ways to target tumors, to treat uh, fibrosis, to prevent skin cancer, to improve diabetes treatment. Uh, uh, these were excellent, excellent proposals. And uh, why don't we all thank and congratulate our finalists for their extraordinary work. So it's now time uh, for us to congratulate the Blavatnik awardees. And uh, I'm going to call them each by name. And I ask you to come to the stage when I call your name. Uh, and Eric will actually, uh, Eric will hand, hand, hand you the trophy uh, that uh, goes with the award. So Alana Shepherds. Stay up here for a photograph, or they go back. Okay, we're going to keep the awardees up here. We're right. Anton Bennett. <laughs> Stephen Strittmatter. Representing on behalf of Stephen, thank you. Yes. Andrew Shaw. The team of Mark Saltzman, Mike Girardi, and Linda Fong. of the auditorium. <laughs> can we put other people on the other side? Yeah. Okay, we can do that. Congratulations. Anna Pyle. <laughs> Andrew Marenker. <laughs> and finally, Elliot Brown.
So now we're going to turn to the pitch contest winners. Turning promising research, like the projects that we celebrate today, into new ventures is possible because of government and industry uh, partnerships. And I want to mention two key partners who are leading, who are leading sponsors of this event today, uh, Elm Street Ventures and Connecticut Innovations. And I'm delighted to have representatives from each join me in presenting prizes for our pitch contest winners today. So Elm Street Ventures has been an important part of the Yale New Haven entrepreneurial ecosystem since it was formed in 2006. Uh, it, is the it is the local seed and early stage venture capital fund, and they have invested in 21 companies to date, mo most of which are in New Haven or close uh, to New Haven. 12 of those 21 companies were launched with Yale faculty involvement and with licensed Yale uh, IP. Uh, so I'm pleased to introduce Rob Bettigal, the founder and managing partner of Elm Street Ventures. Let's give a hand to Rob, and he's going to help me with the first set of pitches. Thank you. Great. So uh, I think, Rob, you are going to call up the uh, winners. Thank you, Peter. Um, it's my, uh, my pleasure to uh, have to flip back through all my notes from uh, Gerald's uh, excellent talk earlier. Um, but uh, so these are the, the, the winners of the uh, biotech pitch competition uh, uh, earlier today. Uh, and uh, so our, th our third place uh, winner is uh, Sidera Medicine. That's uh, Jesse Reinhardt and uh, Farron Isaacs. They come up. Our second winner um, uh, is um, Kaidai Rex, which is uh, Jeffrey Chup. Anybody who has ever a dean knows how to shake hands with the right and pass something with the left. Follow his lead. That's the, yeah, <laughs> okay. it's the classic yeah. thing I'm they gonna, teach I'll, you in I'll dean I'll leave school. my book here. So yeah, I have two yeah, hands. All right. Let me, let me do yeah. Get you loaded up here. Yeah, great. <laughs> and the first place of the pitch, biotech pitch competition for this year's uh, Innovation Summit is Exalva, uh, Alana Shepard's. Thank you. Congratulations. Thank you, Rob. So let me tell you about Connecticut Innovations. That's the state's venture capital arm and a strategic venture partner for founders of early stage companies. The relationship between Yale and Connecticut Innovations started about a decade ago, continues to grow. In fact, Connecticut Innovations has invested in more than 50 Yale technology startups. And I'm pleased to introduce you to Dan Wagner, the Managing Director of, in, of Investments at Connecticut Innovations, who will join me on stage and help present the winners of the Tech uh, Pitch Contest. Thank you. 
Um, it's an honor here to be here to represent CI, and um, thanks to Yale and OCR for a great, uh, great event. Uh, and so we'll get on with the uh, the Tech Innovator Awards. Uh, so in third place uh, was the Trellis team. Uh, in second place, uh, we had Rio Medical. And with the big check, uh, first place uh, was Alva Health. Congratulations to all our winners and sponsors. Thank you. Well, Peter, thank you so much for uh, being, being part of this uh, celebration with us. And uh, uh, thanks so much to, to, to everybody who's participated. Gerald, thank you so much for a great keynote. Jim, is Jim here? Is Jim still here with Jim Hornthal? Um, thank you so much um, to both of our keynotes and to our, our moderators and our panelists, especially Roy Herbst, who uh, gave his great biotech address here earlier this afternoon. And thank you to all of our pitch content contestants, uh, poster presenters, showcase presenters. Um, without that kind of engagement, uh, we, we, couldn't, we couldn't make this as fun of a day as it is. So um, very special thank you to Elm Street Ventures, um, and special thanks to Rob Bettigal and Chris McLeod for really helping plan and moderating a couple excellent panels. Um, Goodwin Law, thank you Chris Dan for, for, for organizing uh, your panel and Connecticut Innovations and Pierre Fabre for your leading uh, sponsorship of this event. And, and thank you Yale School of Management for letting us use this beautiful facility and for all, all your help. And, and, and thank you to all of you um, for uh, your, your participation in this and making it a great day. So thanks, let's, let's a round of applause for all of our winners. <laughs>